Bron, Andy Lockwood, welcome all the way from Canada to Bear Arms HQ and the H-Hour podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Thanks for making the journey solely for this this interview. I appreciate it. Appreciate my pleasure, it. no worries at all. And if you can find the opportunity for anything else in my life, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I highly recommend it. Might squeeze some work in, but yeah, yeah, this, is, this was the main effort. <laughs> I want to start with, um, so when we were doing the icebreaker just now, you mentioned that you read a bunch of stuff and one of the things you're reading is a paper on how empathy can impact the performance of football yes mate. teams yeah of teams okay why that why that topic yeah why that paper as what you read like what you're studying and also what the findings what you're learning about about that cool it, it's a really interesting subject and uh so the start point is I am I'm doing a PhD based on a concept that I came up with a couple of years ago, which I call the three pillars, and it is based on my experience in the military. Uh, I'm a f- experience in professional sport, and it is related to there's three things. The first is shared experience, the second is mutual understanding, and the third is empathy. And a really easy way of thinking about this is if you think about teams that you were part of in whatever walk of life, whether that's now or when, when you're in the military. The teams that you thought were effective and that you probably enjoyed being part of had those three, had high levels of those three areas. The flip side of that is that teams that perhaps weren't as effective and that maybe you didn't enjoy being part of, at least one of those three elements was probably missing. Uh, and so this concept of the three pillars was turned into a PhD, I started looking at it. When I started diving into empathy, empathy is a really interesting subject because it links to performance in terms of um, actual performance, in terms of being able to score points or goals or whatever it is the sport you're doing. And it also links to your ability to be resilient as well. But the bit about performance is really interesting. So there was a paper uh, on an Italian football team and when what they realised is that when they raised the levels of empathy within the team amongst the players, the number of shots on goal increased and the number of goals they scored also increased as well. How were they raising the empathy? That was done uh, off-field by workshops, group sessions, uh, one-to-ones, but it was allowing the players to understand each other a lot more. Can you give an example of how, what one of those workshops would have looked like, for example? How did they... What was it? So one of the things they did was they wanted each person, so they did a series of one-on-ones. This is one of the things they did. There was a, there was a number of other things. One of the things they did was a series of one-on-ones between each of the players. Uh, and they wanted the players to find out a bit more about each other. So they devised a series of set questions. You know, Where are you from? What do you enjoy? A little bit like the, uh, uh, the icebreaker uh, that we just did. And what it did was it allowed the players to understand each other a lot more. And once you can understand someone, you can then have much more feelings of understanding and empathy towards them. Makes total sense. Do you think that's one of the reasons that a bond is formed in in things like the military, the army, that is very, very different bond formed to other careers should we say because you live with each other 24 7 for yep. long periods you are you are 100 percent right and i suppose it would be a bit like whenever you deploy for three six months however long that group of people you become really tight with and you understand each other to the point where you, know, you really understand each other and you know stuff about each other because you've spent so much time together so in that instance you have huge levels of shared experience because you're out on patrol, you're doing stuff together all the time. That leads then to real, because of that amount of time you're spending together, really high levels of uh, mutual understanding, which then if you sort of then add some empathy into that mix, you have a really effective team or the framework for a really effective team. So is the reason that you the paper is on football, is that because it's the only place where there's that sort of imp- imp- not empirical evidence, but there's there's uh, they've done this. There's actually practical something practical they can look at in this Italian team who have done it and they can st- and is studyable. Yeah, that that's part of it, and the ability to to measure something. Uh, now this is is tough because you're trying to measure something that is almost unmeasurable, uh, 
and so when you want to turn something that is uh, subjective into something objective so you can measure it you can do, there's a number of things you can do uh, so social sciences are quite big on this so if you do any studies that involve interviewing people or involve people you often have to turn what is essentially someone's opinion and what they think about something into an objective something so you can measure it uh, so and that, that paper was interesting because it's the only one I've found that says in sport empathy increases performance there's a couple of others that say in the military empathy increases team performance which I thought was really interesting uh, there's another one that said uh, the ability to collaborate was a really key factor in leadership a key factor in being an effective leader an effective leader yeah yep uh -huh. so so in that Italian study it like you said it's hard to prove exactly what the cause of the increased performance was but it's most likely to be those three things is what they're saying it's, it was the, the one thing they talked about was the increased levels of empathy and the way they described it was uh empathy is about understanding someone else and an understanding between you and, uh, and another person and if two players understand each other to a high level if one has the ball uh, and they see a player moving they know that that player is going to do something before they get the ball so the ball carrier can then put the ball where that player wants it to go which increases their chance of performing whatever the subsequent skill is which then increases the number of shots on goal Equally, if you're uh, receiving the ball and someone someone's going to kick it to you, or pass it to you, you know that they like to do it in a certain way. So you might adjust what you're doing to receive the ball more effectively, which then increases skill, uh, the ability to transfer the skill, and it increases the shots on goal and the eventual goals. So it's about empathy, but related to understanding someone else. Hmm. Is it deep learning about how they spotted this? It's quite impressive that they spotted this in the first, it, 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 just in the first place, yeah, isn't it? It is. It can't um, have been obvious. No, and it, it it wasn't it it wasn't the aim of the study, but it was an unintended outcome that ah, they realised because right. they, they wondered they were looking at empathy within team sports, and then when they increased the empathy, they said oh, more shots on goal. So when they went and revisited what they did, their their understanding was that um, uh, the researchers thought that the higher levels of understanding between two people and this could be a small physical cue for example a, a player uh, might like to fake <coughs> left before they then t go right to receive the ball or something like that whatever it might be some small skill but if you know that if they fake one way you're not going to pass on the ball because you know that they're going to go the other way and so the ability to uh, perform that particular skill increases which then has a knock-on effect to the other things Mm. which then increases that overall performance yeah um, makes total sense have you thought about you must have thought about implementing something empathy related in rugby to increase performance or at least communicating this stuff to rugby teams uh, I, I have and I've <laughs> I, I've done it to I've done it with uh a football team and a basketball team so far um, rugby is interesting and sport is really interesting because you can you can see this in action at the moment and historically so when you think about some really effective coaches or managers over the years Alex Ferguson okay high high levels of empathy you, sp you listen to the players now talk about him in the past they loved him huge levels of empathy if you look at oh, Steve Kerr uh, at the Golden State Warriors, re for the last five years, Golden State Warriors have been brilliant. Um, he is a hugely empathetic coach. Uh, other examples might be, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting his name, but the guy who coached uh, Michael Jordan uh, in the the documentary, that was, uh, his name is Phil Jackson. Okay. okay. Phil Jackson's got a book called Eleven Rings, which is about how his um, philosophy and how he approached uh, coaching and managing basketball players. And he won 11 NBA titles with the Chicago Bulls uh, and the LA Lakers. And it talks about how he approached his coaching and leadership with that era of basketball player 
and it's very very high levels of empathy and understanding with the players hmm I'd imagine it's something that could become I mean it's, I would say it's relevant now in in what's the word yes in, in, in the day to day corporations businesses organisations right money making organisations or organisations that do anything really um, but when you think that it's increasingly difficult for no. It's increasingly less likely that uh, it's, it's increasingly likely that people will chop and change jobs for on a, on a, also on a year to year basis than yep. it was sort of ten fifteen years ago. It's, I read it somewhere that people are, le- are less loyal now than they used to be in mm-hmm. chop and change jobs, which means then, but maybe that it's harder for organisations to get people who are emotionally invested in the job they do in the teams they're part of and the strategic goals, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Now, there's another interesting study I read, uh, and it was it was a, a, an amalgamation of a number, um, and, and they, they pulled a load of um, studies together, and basically what they found that high levels of empathy in an organisation increase KPIs, so your key performance indicators, and that was across a number of industries. So we're talking business, so it increases profits. In the uh, medical um, industry, uh, there were lower mortality rates and uh, faster recovery rates, uh, which I thought was a really interesting one. Increase in empathy means more people more people survive. Uh, in the military, it was linked to more effective leadership, uh, and then that one in sport about... Uh, but, and then there's some general kind of stuff about you know, teams that are uh, have high levels of empathy are often more collaborative, more effective, uh, and so that, increase, that therefore increases their, their ability to hit their KPIs. Hmm. So, have you actually done done an implementation of increasing empathy in any organisations yourself or teams? So, yes, kind of. Um, I so as part of the PhD, I uh, started something called Grey Wolf Teams, and I provide some leadership and culture development advice to sports coaches. I did a couple of sessions with uh, a team called Inter Miami in the US with their academy and performance staff. Uh, and then I did uh, the same thing with the performance staff from the Sacramento Kings, who are a basketball team. I have subsequently rolled out a kind of one-to-one, a small group mentoring with a couple of the coaches from the Sacramento Kings from the performance team. And one of the things we talk about a lot is yeah. the ability to develop trust and how you can develop a effective high empathy environment within the kind of performance side of it. And so they do all the physical aspect and the physical training uh, of the players. Uh, and so it was interesting to see what their thoughts on where they were as an organization and then how they could sort of use those kind of military concepts that you, know, you and I and other military people would know and understand uh, and how they could implement that in terms of developing trust and empathy and teamwork and things like that. Are there any, are there any downsides to increase in empathy in, uh, in sports teams like we're talking about here. I can't imagine it's all roses. There must be some downsides there. I think one of the areas... So I think there's a perception issue in that when we talk, when you talk about empathy, people immediately think, oh, it's all hugs and sandals and burning incense. And actually... But you can actually be highly empathetic and relatively, I suppose you'd call it tough as well. Yeah, and that, that's not that's not a uh, the two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can you can absolutely say no, no, these are the standards, and if you don't meet the standard, you're out. But you can do that with a high level of empathy as well. So what I think you'll find is that you start talking about empathy, and some people will immediately go, no, not I don't want. So stick some sandals on, burn some incense, and, and start hugging people. And you know, it's not about it's not about that. That's it's about increasing performance, not the kind of uh, not the perception of what empathy might be. Hmm. What led you to the What's led you to the PhD? How did you get there? No, I suppose. You can't see bags because he's off camera. Uh, but uh, him and I, oh, years ago, we um, we got sent to. We were working at the same place, uh, and we got sent to Bath Academy to help out with their um, their preseason with the uh, with the juniors, the 16s and the 18s. 
I went back the next year. When you say we got sent, the unit got sent. No, just bags and items. Just okay. to, so we, we did a bit of um, leadership development with some of the young players, the under 16s and under 18s. Um, I went back the next year uh, and did exactly the same thing. And then I asked to if there's anything where I could stay on and do some, do some other stuff. And they said, yeah, actually, we have a um, we run an internship in the performance team. And I went, great, all right. And I was a 35 when I started. I was the oldest intern in the world. Uh, but it meant that I had, uh, I spent a couple of years in the academy. It was great fun. One of the coaches down there said to me one day, what makes military teams so effective? I thought, I'd never given that any thought whatsoever. And I didn't really, I couldn't give him an answer straight away. But when I kind of thought about it, and I mulled this over in my head, I came up with this idea of shared experience because we all live, work, fight together. Mutual understanding, because you know exactly what someone's gonna do at any given point. Let's take some kind of um, deliberate attack, right? You know that one section who are crawling forward, uh, ready to post a grenade, you know exactly what they're gonna do. You know what the other sections are doing around you as well, because everyone, under instinctively because we've been trained highly and drilled into us you understand what other people are doing and what they're going through and then I thought you know, that third bit then empathy well the teams that I'd been part of in the military the effective ones really high levels of empathy when there'd been low levels of empathy or very little is when you start to see toxic leadership and that kind of those kind of traits emerge so the, I came up with those three ideas I, uh, this was, well, it would have been about 2015, 2017, something like that. I mulled this over in my, uh, in my head and I had a chat with some other uh, rugby coaches about this idea. Um, and it seemed to have some kind of traction and they were, they were quite taken with it. I then, at about that time, I was thinking, oh, I should probably do something to kind of legitimise this. Uh, and I thought, oh, I suppose I could maybe do a master's. And I thought, if you're going to be a bear, you know, be a grizzly. And I thought, right, why am I going to do a master's when I could, I could just turn it into a, I could do a PhD in it. And that was the thought process uh, that en ended up with, you know, where it is today. Hmm. What was Bath like? What was Bath Academy like? Good fun. Um, when we started down there, uh, Danny Grucock was the um, academy manager one of the biggest humans I've ever met. <laughs> how big, how tall is that? I mean, tall is that? Oh, we, I was in the academy office one day and, uh, and it all went, it, all, it got a bit dark. And I looked at the window thinking, mm, sun's, uh, sun's gone in. Uh, no, he'd just come in the door and blocked the doorway. The, um, the man was just, I, I get rugby players are big, having grown up playing rugby. You know, professional rugby players are big. But when you see them on TV, you know they're big. But they're all big so you have no frame of reference yeah, yeah. so when you meet them you're like oh my god you're enormous yeah uh and then you know walking around the farley house which is where they uh did the training and you you'd bump in occasionally bump into some of the first team and you're like, so uh matt banahan was playing for bath at the time yeah. um sort of center wing fullback he's about six foot five and a hundred and something kilo the man yeah, is enormous and you sort of look up and look at like across the shoulders and just thinking but yeah, it was good fun. Uh, and um, it meant that, uh, you know, I got, to, I got to see what the pathway and professional rugby is like, but from a kind of slightly outside perspective. And having never been good enough to be a professional rugby player, uh, it, was, it was interesting seeing, so I'll have a peek behind the curtain. Yeah, I, I'm down at the Ospreys Academy, probably three or four times a year oh, nice. and uh, it's the same experience yeah it's the same experiences I think it's like my god they're big my god it's intimidating I go down and they got an in one of the pitches they got an indoor <laughs> training pitch I'll go yeah. down and wander yeah. down there with what their kit guy kit man a guy called Sean McAuliffe is ex-military oh, and I met him okay. through Forces Barbarians and we became mates there's a load of ex-military in professional rugby <laughs> there is there's 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 quite there's, a few yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so the uh the kit man at Bar uh, Saracens is ex Power Reg. Really? A Andy Dowling, I think his name is. He's I just. Know that name. There's just been a. Oh, there's been an article in on him. Um, I think he 
he either got out because of PTSD or he he's he's sort of been diagnosed with it subsequently. But there was an article about that. So Saracens have got one. The kit man at Leicester Tigers is an ex ex army ex royal engineer. The player development manager at Harlequins is ex army, and yeah. I think he's a royal engineer as well. Ex the Chiefs, the forwards coach is an ex. Uh, he's a royal. He's a royal engineer as well. So there seems to be a bit of a royal engineer monopoly on uh, getting into professional sport. But yeah, there's there's a number of ex military and professional sport floating just, around the place. I'm just looking up Andy. This is good information for forces barbarians. <laughs> So um, if you if you need a kit man, you might give him. A yeah, yeah. I'm not sure there'll be much free stash, but you know, you never know. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, they're all units. Mm. And the other thing is, man, it makes me wish I had been able to play professional rugby. Yeah, I know being what you mean. being around that place and seeing the trip and just thinking, man, these guys eat, sleep, breathe rugby. Yeah, you know, and. and when you see him doing that, it makes me think they must be as capable at, at rugby as we, as I was capable and the teams I was part of capable at military stuff yeah. for the same reasons. They're doing it all the time. Yeah. Doing it all the time. And they love it and they enjoy it and yeah. they turn up every day thinking, great, what are we going to do yeah, today? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So cool. So cool. However, however, the uh, professional sports person's uh, career is often short and extremely strenuous yeah. and contract jumping and all the rest of it especially in rugby at the minute you know yeah. with, uh, with what's three, three teams three teams in the UK going bust two in North America rugby teams crazy um, yeah uh, and in fact not so long ago the oh, the Southern Kings who were in um, uh, were they super rugby Southern Kings yeah they went bust as well they're a South African team uh, yeah, funnily enough, I was on a, uh, at a phone call with a, a guy who is, where is he now? He's at, I think he's at Harlequins. He's at one of the premiership teams and he is looking at getting into coaching. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was saying he'd, he'd sort of bounced around the leagues, bounced around the teams and he just wanted a, you know, some, oh, no, no, he's not, he's at, he's at Falcons, sorry, he's at Newcastle. And he just wants just stability because he's thinking, you know, he's probably only got a season or two left. And he was thinking, well, what am I going to do after rugby? And so I sort of took him through some ideas on some career coaching on what he, certain options he could have. But yeah, he was in his, I think he's in his early 30s and he's sort of thinking about, you know, wrapping that, wrap, wrapping that career up and starting a different one. Hmm. Well, yeah. Um, You've not got a long left. What are you going to do when you leave? <laughs> That's a great question. Having uh, said that, you've yeah, got yeah. your fingers in a lot of pies anyway. Okay, so... I, I you've got Grey Wolf. Yeah, yeah. I have. So Grey Wolf teams, I run something called... Um, I run a couple of online um, things which effectively do, they do the same thing, which is they connect uh, people to jobs in sport. Rugby vacancies is one of them. Um, and there's another one called um, Strength and Conditioning Vacancies. So exactly the same. So when I finished at Bath, I found myself with no involvement in rugby whatsoever for the first time in 30 years, which is a really strange mm. feeling. You know, no playing, no coaching, nothing. So I was looking for all these jobs. I thought, well, since I was finding a lot, but it didn't suit me, you know, time, place, you know, point in my life, that kind of thing. But I'd send them to some mates and say, oh, mate, this is near you. You should have a look at it. And I thought, well, why not put it all in one place? And then people can come and have a look at it. And that was the kind of birth of this thing called Rugby Vacancies. I've been doing it since about 2017 now, and um, it, it's going all right. Um, so how do yeah. you get, who, who, who uh, what's the word, um, co, uh, co, who brings the vacancies together and puts them on there? It's all me, it's only me. Okay. So I, d I do it two ways. I either find them myself or clubs get in touch. Um, and I have, and I, I sort of, I post these jobs on online and, and people come and have a look and there's always a link or an email and it's all, it's all free to look at so if anyone's into, into rugby um, they just come and have a look and, and if it's near them they can go and apply mm -hmm. and then what was the other you got the Rugby out Outreach Project as oh well, yeah right? so yeah uh, and I got run a charity called the Rugby Outreach Project and that gives sort of rugby fitness and s &C advice to teams around the world um, Bags is a um, director of that charity and I'm looking at him because I've just realised I haven't put this year's accounts in so he's going to get an email from <laughs> from the Charities Commission saying uh, why haven't you put your accounts in this year <laughs> so and that, and that went that's been a bit quiet recently but it went it was going really well I, I was helping out 
you know teams from you know sevens teams who are in the highlands of Papua New Guinea and they play sevens because they can't get 13 or 15 people on the pitch they haven't got enough fighting age males in the village all the way up to you know I was helping um, uh, Ugandan women's national team I was given some training programs to the uh, Tonga squad who were on island not the guys who were off playing professionally around the world but some of the guys who were still on the island and kind of and everything in between that on that subject sorry just off topics a minute did you watch Oceans Apart yes uh, no I didn't I watched the one uh, the other one on the Fijian winger Rupeni and I'm trying to think of his surname Kakabao okay who uh, he basically played for Fiji played professionally in France and he's now a taxi driver in Fiji oh my god yeah yeah, yeah. it's 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 you're like all oh, right how did that happen um, but no I haven't watched Worlds Apart but I watched Dan Leo Ocean's who Apart. Ocean's, Ocean's Apart sorry yeah, yeah. but Dan Leo the guy who made that made that second documentary I saw that one but yeah Oceans Apart is a fascinating Dan yeah. made Oceans Apart as well yeah did oh you yeah. made them both yeah I think ah, so yeah. sorry yeah. sorry sorry I mean it's a shocking state of affairs yeah, yeah. you can get, can get away with it I, I, it, it uh, it's very frustrating and I don't know world, world rugby didn't come across very well in, in, in it no and it makes you think that you know the the idea that you know Fiji Tonga Samoa it's almost like they are handcuffed in their ability you know, I've watched Fiji play for years I've played with a load of Fijians uh, and I always think that Fiji should be higher in the world rankings than they are I think they will be now that the the Drua are in Super Rugby uh, the, male, the men and the women's teams uh, uh, I think that in the next the next World Cup Fiji will pro. I'd like to say they'd get the semi-finals I'm not sure if they're there yet but in a couple of years I think Fiji will be a World Cup semi-final team mm. um, what is your favourite we are bouncing around you. What is your most <laughs> memorable rugby match, international rugby match that you've watched? I went to watch the All Blacks play France at the Principality in... When was that World Cup? I can't remember the year. Uh, but I, I watched the All Blacks dismantle France... <laughs> By about sixty points, oh, really? uh, and I was I was quite high up in the stands, and um, I was uh, I was on the side, and it was Julian Savea was the winger. He scored four tries, I think, that night. One of them, he bumped four French players on his way to the try line. I was almost kind of looking down <laughs> that bit of the pitch as he was mm. bouncing French players off him and then going over the try line. That was yeah, that was that was a that was an interesting night because there was a load of Irish supporters in the crowd. And they'd obviously looked at the draw and gone, oh yeah, we might make this quarterfinal. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they'd bought loads of tickets and none of them went at all. So it was, yeah, so there was a big, big Irish supporters in the crowd making loads of noise. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, the All Blacks France. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's the um, Japan versus South Africa. And I think it was 2015 World Cup. The the miracle in Brighton. Oh my God. Oh, it was in Brighton. <laughs> it was in Brighton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, yeah, I, I've never, I've never shouted so much. I was watching it on TV. Yeah, I've never gone crazy like I, I used to go crazy a lot of rugby <laughs> matches when we else were playing. Never saw that. What I, what I always, what always sticks in my mind is at half time, Japanese fans were crying in the stands with happiness just because they were in the lead in the lead at half time and they were crying <laughs> like it was the, it was like a yeah. monumental moment yeah. in like Japanese history and they went on to win the game yeah. just incredible it's an underdog story isn't it everyone it is, everyone right. loves the underdog story. and it was also a really good last try to win the, mm. to win the game which which it wasn't it wasn't a you know I mean it wasn't like a absolute classic but it was a good try to finish the game to win it wasn't just some boring thing where you know they they a penalty trial something that would have been a little bit you know contentious it was an, a genuine out and out good try mm. back to all blacks then yeah on the subject of performance what why do you think they are light years ahead of everyone else although it seem although the gap seems to be closing now yeah. but why do you think they're light years ahead oh, or have been that comes down to and this is just a sort of outsider's perspective i think that under uh the previous coach 
and I'm trying to think of his name now. Uh, they went about 10 years. Um, Steve Hansen. Oh, yeah. They went about 10 years of being almost unbeatable. Almost. 80% win rate. The best win rate of any sports team, a professional sports team, I think, ever. Over that kind of 10-year period. So when you look at it... You think, well, okay, across any sport? I think it was, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. yeah I think it was. I think they are, they are unique <sighs> in that. For, for that long. I think Wild. the... England women's rugby have the longest winning uh, undefeated period of 20 summit games but I think over that kind of 10 year period the All Blacks had about 80% win rate which is unbelievable so why especially when you consider how small their pool of players yeah. talent is compared yeah. to everybody else yeah or oh, most other most other teams yeah. I'd say yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that that links partly to it in that they so firstly, rugby is the main sport in New Zealand, okay? Um, in the UK, it's football, hands down. Where I am in Canada, ice hockey, okay? And there's a reason why the NHL has 60% of players that come from Canada. It is their thing, right? New Zealand is, you know, has rugby, rugby is their thing. So straight away, you have a high percentage of the population who play a lot. Those players will then play with and against each other as they're all coming up through the system, which means when they get to be an All Black, they've already played against or with the other people on that squad multiple times. Mm. So when we go back to that, that framework I was talking about, mm. massive levels of shared experience, so they understand each other, huge levels of mutual understanding, one, because they play together, secondly, because um, they... Uh, the principles that the All Blacks adhere to, everyone adheres to. So everyone has an understanding of their behaviours, what's expected of them off the pitch and on the pitch as well. So high levels of, of that kind of um, mutual understanding. And then when you, if you've, there's a couple, Steve Hansen's done a couple of podcasts where he reflects back on that time as his time as the All Black coach. And the thing that struck me was he was a, he was, he could be quite a you know, pragmatic and tough coach, but he was also very empathetic and very understanding of the players so when you wrap all that together yeah, and, and you had a, a relatively settled squad as well so uh, who was the centre pairing uh, Smith and uh, not Umanga uh, his name's going to come to me later those guys played together for something like 50 plus tests together as a centre partnership you know you you develop that level of understanding of each other. And if you replicate that across the squad and then you start slowly bringing in other quality players who who understand themselves, the environment they come from, they understand what's expected of them, you then see those outcomes on the pitch. A little bit like, I would say, Ireland. At the I was moment. about to say exactly yeah, the yeah. same thing. Yeah, you, yeah. When you were talk, I hadn't thought of it before. You, you were thinking about Ireland mm. for the same reason, yeah. It actually made me think about when I was playing school rugby. Yeah. And there was a period of three or four years where the school side, we lost maybe two matches in that entire, two 15s matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost some 10s, we lost some 7s. But for that two or three year period, we lost, it was, it was something like, it was only like two matches and there were two finals that we lost. But what was, what was particular, it may even be over five years, you know, it was a handful of matches. Anyway, what was particular about the side was that 90 odd percent of yeah. that side, we also played for the local rugby club. So you were playing at school, playing, you were school, playing on a Saturday playing or a Sunday, club, and they had all the social environment around that. We were like, yep. we were just living with each other, yeah, yeah. Uh, not actually, but you know, living, eating, breathing rugby, and with each other all the time. Yeah, training and playing double the amount that yep. most other school boys were playing, but together. Yeah, you know, and we were we were unbeatable. In Ireland, yeah, similar, but there's also something there with the Island and New Zealand that they're very different culturally, culturally to most other places, and the Pacific Islands but they're yeah. very different culturally to the European teams right the major European teams you could it could be argued yeah. I say Ireland's very different to Scotland and England and Wales very yep you know? and I know that because I play Gaelic football and hurling with a lot of Irish expats they are Didn't very different to a- <laughs> Gaelic football <laughs> yeah, what yeah, a yeah. sport that is hey. yeah what, why that isn't more popular I do not know I mean, it's quite popular in the West Midlands I didn't realise is it there's teams in the West mm. Midlands I, there's a reg bloke yeah. where I went to Ireland a couple of years back yeah. a few years ago and I watched 
my first Gaelic football match there. Yeah, oh, fucking, it was the, it was the final, I think, and it was just incredible. Oh, and I Craig, came back Craig and benched Park. it. Yeah, uh, no, I didn't go. There. Oh, okay, yeah, watch, you watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I came back and mentioned to a reg blog up in Coventry at the time, mm. and he said he plays Gaelic football in the West Midlands. Yes, I thought. I was the only person in the military. Was, <laughs> I'm glad there's more because actually, from when was it? Up until 2002, we weren't allowed to play. Uh, uh, of course. So it's only in the last 20 or so years. Um, but I, I sort of fell into it almost by accident. Um, but yeah, Gaelic football and hurling, great, great, great sports. But what's interesting about the link to rugby is that um, a number of the current and ex Ireland squad played when they were growing up so uh, the current fullback uh, and, he, and I'm going to forget his name now but he played Ireland 7s before he played the 15s he also played high level Gaelic football mm. uh, the tag furlong the prop played representative level Gaelic football and there's a small clip of him I saw on social media and he's about 16 or 18 kind of years old um, he's already about 100 kilos really quick feet really good hands so when people are surprised that this prop can sidestep and go through get but it's no surprise at all because he grew up playing he grew mm. up playing different sports yeah that's not that unusual though is it for high level athletes to be playing different sports but around the same core thing like a ball for example yeah and you get the you know fighters do MMA they do boxing or judo and yeah it makes sense ever. um yeah, Gareth Edwards was a Commonwealth 400 metre hurdler. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, was yeah, he? yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know if he won any medals, but I think I think he competed in the Commonwealth Games. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So when he finishes that try for the Barbars against the All Blacks <laughs> in the 70s, the reason he's that fast is because he's a he's an international level sprinter. Yeah. 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 Um, which uh, which which UK which UK pro rugby team do you think has got the best development system in place perform and performance improvement system in place at the moment the metric I would use is the number of players they bring through from their academy system and when you look at the current if you look across the premiership now you have teams like Northampton who have a lot of they've brought a lot of guys through Exeter traditionally have done very well at bringing their academy players through. Yeah. I think uh, a couple of years ago, Exeter contracted about 10 of their academy players. And what's interesting about Chiefs is that they, their academy teams are run on a similar level as their first team. And I'm sure the other teams do this as well, but I only know Exeter because I know one of the coaches. And so they look at, they look at if, so you start the kind of, not not so much systems, but you start the style of play and how you, the kind of extra way of playing in the academy, so that makes that transition easier when they when they go up into the first team. Um, but I think a lot of teams are doing very well at bringing their academy players through. Uh, I've mentioned two, um, Northampton and Exeter, uh, but I know that um, I think Sale do quite well at bringing their their academy players through. I mean, they are the only team. In the north, same with Falcons as well. In the northeast, when you're saying they do well at bringing them through, mm. what do you mean specifically? You mean the percentage of them that are successful in getting a contract in the first team? Yeah, yeah, that's probably the easiest metric to look at because you can see the numbers that are coming through each year uh, and each season. Bath. Well, so when I was in the academy at Bath, uh, they'd come in at about under 15, and they they'd select big trial they'd select about 100 at that kind of level they'd make a cut at under 16s uh, and then they'd make a cut at under 18s and so under 18s you had about 50 players in the wider um, performance squad of those 50 I think the first year I was there they took 5 the second year they also took 5 as well so they're taking about 10% slightly less if you, if you think about the 100 that started how many they take but you know that's that's probably more than Premiership Academies uh, sorry Premier League Football Academies who might take is it really? yeah so Premier that's League that's surprising well smaller squads so a rugby squad needs to be about 40 
because of injuries, internationals, attrition, and so on. Mm. A Premier League football squad is probably, I mean, I don't follow football knowledge, I'd hazard a guess at about in the 20 to 30 kind of range. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's smaller squads, so you don't need that much coming in. The other thing is that in football, the money goes a lot further down. So if you come out of a Premier League academy and you don't make it into the first team squad, potentially there's other avenues for you as well. Whereas if you don't, if you come out of a Premiership Academy in rugby and you don't make it into the first team, there's not that many other full time opportunities open to you. Hmm, that's an interesting point in the money that it, it finds its it, uh, it it reaches further down. What? What? My my little experience with football coaching at coaching at a youth level mm. girls team. Um, not that I've got any had any football experience at the time. It was, I ended up coaching the keeper. No keeper experience myself. It was my daughter started playing, and they and the team needed a hand. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, cool, love it. Yeah, yeah. Didn't have a clue. I mean, that old joke doesn't know the offside rule. I didn't. <laughs> The only well, they're explaining first. it to you as you went. Well, it didn't. They didn't play the offside rule at that age. Oh, okay. When they started, they did about two years later, and it was a problem because I was getting calls wrong. <laughs> I didn't know you couldn't be offside from a throw-in, for example. You know, like a yeah. Throw-in. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> one of the things I noticed in there with football, stark contrast to rugby, obviously, which rugby at youth level, I like, vast experience in it from yeah. playing, um, was the involvement of money. At grassroots age, do you have any? And do you have any knowledge of how? How? Yeah, if my kids, if my kids wanted crazy. to move clubs mid-season, yep. for example, there was a transfer fee. <laughs> Are we talking seven, eight years old? You're not fifteen. Seven, eight years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. Transfer fee yeah. that would have to be paid to the league. Uh, just as one example. Yeah. You know, it, it was absolute madness. And one of the things that really surprised me about it, the whole thing was that. So I was part of the committee as well. I was a club welfare officer and all that. So I got to go to the league committee meetings and all the oh, yeah. and the AGMs and stuff like this. I remember the first meeting we went to, and I got warned off before about the league was sitting on all this money and they never do anything with it. Yada yada yada. And in that meeting, the league was sitting on it was either sixty nine or ninety six thousand pounds. They were sitting on, which I mean, this is that's some, a child's league. This is a youth league. <laughs> this is a youth <laughs> league, right? Um, I can't remember the name. It, it, it's something, something tendering. Is up, you know, Essex way mm-hmm. uh, league. And I thought, one, I was like, what the fuck are they going to do with this money? There's no yeah. plan. They didn't communicate any plan to spend it. Money would go into the league. They would have some minor outgoings, whatever. And then, yeah. and then they just their bank would chop up that season. Next season, they just bring more money in. Yeah. There was very little going towards development or anything else. And what also frustrated me with it was. You know, in rugby, I, I don't know where you grew up playing rugby, right? Devon. Okay, Devon. Yeah. I grew up in South Wales playing rugby. You go and play a match, when you finish, you, that match would be at the opposition's club, yeah. normally, because yeah. it was very rare for a team not to have an actual club house or grounds. Yeah. You go there, and then you go in the clubhouse after, and they would put on food for you. Maybe you get a free drink as well, but you, the yeah. players would get food. Football, not the case. The, every game we youth level so bear in mind all that money I just said that was in mm. that, that league and this isn't particularly that league this is across the board in England anyway I don't know how it works in Wales all that money and I never went to one football club where my girls went to play where they had their own ground everything was borrowed you were either on some community pitch in the middle of a village or a town somewhere mm. or you were in a clubhouse that wasn't actually the clubhouse of that team it was a a communal sports club Got you, yeah, yeah. that the team would have to pay to go and play there just bonkers all of that yeah. money and nothing to show for it and it made me wonder how that how that impacts um, the quality of players as they go up the chain because if you're introducing money at that young age yeah. right just even just as a concept you're not playing the players Play, p- paying the players but it does happen at a lot younger age right but you introducing money as a concept and influence in that sport it must have an impact on their like their emotional investment in that sport and therefore the quality and perf- performance as you go up You're probably right but then when I think about rugby and rugby turning professional it seems to have improved the quality and performance as opposed to hinder it which would make sense, but then I wonder what... You mean at the lower 
at the lower no, level. No, at the top end. At the top, the top end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but then, there is problems at grassroots rugby wise, isn't there? Yeah, it's how it's struggling. So the the so, so, at the, mm. at the kind of local amateur grassroots level, I would say that one of the big issues is firstly attracting people into the sport, and I think sport, I think across the board, sport, a lot of sports are having that. Some of the sports are having that issue. Um, but once you've got people uh, through the door, it's then keeping them and keeping them past the kind of 14, 15, 16 age bracket to then go on to kind of senior rugby at 18, 19 and above, you know, there's a, there's a massive drop off. And it is, and in rugby, it's really prevalent. Um, I mean, I, COVID definitely didn't help. Um, but over the last couple of years, you know, there's been a a number, and it's actually, interestingly, it's in the senior teams as well. So in, in this kind of, not sure what's the women's game, but in the men's teams, there are, you know, there were a number of games called off uh, this season and last season because teams just couldn't, they couldn't get 15 on the pitch. Mm. Um, and if you have to borrow, you know, you forfeit, if you're in a league, you forfeit that game. I played loads of games growing up where you either play for the opposition or you borrowed, you know, you borrowed a few um, just to get the game played. Um, but yeah, it, I think rugby in particular has has an issue with attraction and retention, whereas probably football, I suspect, doesn't have an issue with uh, with attraction. Maybe I'm not sure about retention, but certainly with attraction, you know. Uh, yeah, but I think that's just because it's more accessible. Yeah, so a lower barrier to entry to yeah. start. You need a, a ball and a space. You don't need to be That's, a prop. There's no scrums. There's no, you know, you don't have to be taught to tackle. You just run around and kick a ball. Um, it's just, I think that's simplifying football massively. But, it's, no, but yeah, but I, 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 like you said, the, the the entry level yeah. it is really low. About because of the, it's so easy to play. Mm. Which makes me wonder why rugby league isn't more popular because there's no necessarily specific positions you just need 13 people on the pitch to chuck a ball around but you still have to pass backwards there's still some concepts you have to you know pass backwards to move forwards all this kind of stuff but I've I've always wondered why Lee I mean League's enormous in Australia but I've always wondered why it hasn't been more popular elsewhere yes there's a Super League in um, in the UK but I've always wondered why League hasn't taken off elsewhere I think probably just because there's such a massive gap between the popularity of union and yeah, league, right? Because league stemmed from union, and it... yeah, maybe. am I right in saying so? Someone told me, who told me this. Am I right in saying that league league came about? Rugby league came about because working men wanted to play rugby, but did not want the high risk of injury that union playing brought. And league was introduced as a lower risk of injury version of rugby. Have you heard that? So it was kind of so there's some brilliant rugby history here that Union went professional in 1995 exactly 100 years earlier in 1895 is when the split happened from Union and they created League huh. uh, which was uh, they didn't that wasn't done on purpose I think that was just coincidence but um, I think League came about because um, <clears throat> people wanted to play on a Saturday but if you were a working man you would be working on Saturday and therefore you wanted compensation because you wouldn't be earning money at your work. And Union said, no, no, it's an amateur game. We can't pay you. League said, well, we're going to make a sport that you can. And when you look at the differences mm. and the reasons they came up with the, those particular rules were actually quite brilliant. They realised that they wanted to make it a more attractive sport. So they wanted more, um, they wanted more tries. And they thought, well, you can create, you can have more tries by creating more space on the pitch. So let's drop two players. They said we want the away fans to come along and watch as well, which means that uh, we're going to give each team the ball the same number of times, so that each team has you know each set of supporters can see their team touching the ball a lot and playing with it. Is that the reason for the two? And so all, that's so all, the reason for the number of tackles. All of these differences in the rules between Lee and, and the restart. So we, we want to get the ball in play as soon as possible. So we're not going to mess about with scrums or lineouts. A tap, ball's away, it's back in play. So all these differences between league and union stemmed from the fact that they realised a hundred or more than that now, hundred plus years ago, that they needed to attract fans to come and watch rugby in order that they could compensate the players. 
I'm wondering the same thing as you now. Why didn't it take off? Yeah, yeah. Why didn't yeah. it take off? Yeah. That is strange. I mean, it's, it? it's enormous in Australia. So, so I think there's there's 14 NRL franchises, and there's uh, four four rugby union teams. Five, one of which is about to go under, which is the Melbourne Rebels. Mm. Yeah. So in Australia, it's massive. League is the national sport of Papua New Guinea. There's a professional league in the UK and France, but outside of those areas, nothing. Or not professional anyway. Uh, did I read somewhere that you were born in Papua New Guinea? I lived there. Lived there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was, so I, I was born in Devon, and then I moved over to Papua New Guinea, and I came back uh, when I was five. My, I think my sixth birthday was the first birthday I had in, in the UK. Really? Yeah. So, but th- you weren't playing rugby in PNG then at that, <laughs> at that age, were you? No, I'm, I'm parent, parents are teachers, so they were, they were working out there and then they took me with them. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. I didn't realise it was a professional sport either. They were, well, the professional sport. They were, yeah. But then why would I have realised that? That is interesting about league, though. Really interesting, especially when you think about all of the different measures that union has taken to try and make the yeah. game more this or more that. You know, um, it almost seems like it, it's stifled by its own complex rules sometimes. Yeah, I think Union, there's an element of that. It? I think I, I like the fact that they are two distinct sports. Mm. Uh, similar, yes. You know, run, tackle, pass, kick, whatever. Um, but I like the fact that they are they are distinctive and they are separate and they are very different. Um, Union, I think, has an issue in that if you want to attract the casual fan if you watch it it looks like an absolute melee and you kind of need someone to describe what's going on Lee you can watch it and you go oh okay they're running to tackle okay. oh okay I kind of see what they're doing there mm. yeah, but that complexity I think makes Union what it is yeah yeah but it's again it's it, yeah I think it's uh, it is it can make it its own worst enemy, right? I mean, look yeah, at I think you're talking right. about football again. One of the one of the beautiful things about football is its simplicity. Yeah, is the simplicity. You know, the casual, the casual, the passerby can be a, become a casual fan quite easily. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Pass the ball about none of this backwards nonsense. Put it in the net. You can play it on the beach uh, yeah. in Brazil, or you can play it in a in a, in a backyard in uh, you know in in London where we are. Yeah, uh, you know, you can play it wherever you want. And there's an element that you can kind of so in in Fiji they play touch rugby everywhere any bit of open grass whether it's flat or bumpy, they'll chuck a ball about and play touch Fiji's probably the only country in the world where that happens everywhere else it's football and you walk down the street wherever and you see people kicking a ball about rather than chucking a rugby ball yeah that's probably one of the that must be one of the major influences on this style of play I know it is with the I know it is with New Zealand as well. Who do we interview? So, so, what, we did a Forces Barbarians like Q and A with a special guest, and he was a Bath Academy guy. Okay, Dan, yeah. not Dan, it might be Dan. Dan, oh, I can't remember his name. He was a he was a Kiwi though. He played for he played for New Zealand. What the heck was his name? He was down coaching at Bath up until about five six years ago. Anyway, yeah. One of the questions he got asked on that call was why uh, New Zealand. What makes New Zealand so special? What is different about what they do? Mm. And one of his one of the things he said was is because they are taught to play evasive rugby. Here in Europe, yeah. we are taught to t- get the ball, take the tackle, take the contact, go to ground, most, and then you you know go from there. Phase two, phase three. Yeah. He said they are taught evade the tackle, and make ground that way, predominantly. Yeah. Sim- and that's when you mentioned. Touch with Fiji. Touch is about evading the fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because um, all the Fijians I used to play with at the regiment played one touch. So if you got touched, the ball got handed over. So they're flinging it around, uh, which means that when you then go and play fifteens, they're doing exactly the same thing. It's yeah, gr- great fun to play. Great they, fun to watch. They are. In, they are <laughs> incredible. The way they are great fun to watch. Yeah. Got, uh, um, we we played them actually. Uh, Forces barbarians played them, um, and it was. It was not pretty. It was not pretty. <laughs> it was not pretty at all. And there were some catastrophic injuries as well. Oh. There was like a fractured femur. Oh, there was a lacerated eyeball. Honestly. Oh. But at the same time, you yeah. marvel at yeah. the way they play. Yeah. 
and you think why can't more teams why are they doing that so effectively yeah. why don't more teams do that you know it's like you people would refer to it as the seventh style of play wouldn't yeah. they but um but uh yeah i wonder how a team of fijians would fare in in professional in, in the premiership so I think they do all right, and you, you can take the example of Fiji and Drua, who are playing in Super Rugby this year yeah. uh, and last year as well, and they are they are doing really well. Uh, they who did they beat the other day? They beat someone the other day, but the, the key is they're playing home games in Fiji, and they are it, they are selling out whatever ground they're you know as you can imagine, everyone wants to come and watch, uh, and it is like an international every weekend with, mm. with, with, the, with the Super Rugby teams that are coming from New Zealand or from from Australia. Mm. Now we were talking about we mentioned earlier Japan, South Africa. Got Cut, cut the questions. If you've got an opinion on this, why do you think Japan were able to pull off that win? And secondly, what do you think of Eddie Jones as a leader of professional teams? Okay, so what? How did they pull that win off? I think they did some very specific things. I think they analysed the South Africans' game and worked out what they could what they could exploit so that was the first thing what well, so tactically exploit you know uh that's the africans game i think they worked out or, or they they worked up probably classic military chat they worked up a couple of covers that they thought the south africans were going to go for most likely most dangerous all that kind of stuff and then they were able to work out how to counter that and i think they did that very effectively uh which meant that that gave them the opportunity as well as being they didn't just do that they also worked out what their strengths were and how they wanted to attack which is why I think they were up at half time and then they got that final that final try so there was, there's an element of kind of you know know your enemy um, and then Eddie Jones is a leader when he left England none of the players came out and said it was awful I hated it I hated being under him um, hmm. but I know that having sp- so I, I, I used to play with one of the um, coaches at um, Exeter and when Henry Slade wasn't getting in the team it, they were like well why is what, this is one of England's best centres at the time how many years ago it was oh he still is good sorry um, but at the time he was one of England's best centres you know how is he not getting in the team uh, and, and the sort of the, the, the chat coming from from this guy was that uh, there was a li- Eddie Jones was not quite uh, he was trying to keep players interested and, and, and kind of on the hook and, and, and motivated but perhaps not doing it in a particularly effective way uh, that being said that was that was one player but no players came out and said yeah I'm glad he's gone I hated it it was terrible under him so you know I would take from that that potentially he was quite an effective manager, quite an effective leader. Um, and his book is interesting. I haven't read his book, uh, but other people that have have said that you know the some of his ideas around leadership uh, have got that kind of. You can see that connection to the military, which I thought was quite interesting. Okay, next question. <laughs> but it's like by being back in the icebreaker. <laughs> Why do you think there is a? major difference between the the way team managers head coaches in football are treated compared to in rugby and what I mean specifically is a couple of bad matches and you're sacked yeah. in football and in rugby it's not the case and I, I worry sometimes that we would go that way it would be I think it would be disastrous yeah, yeah. yeah. but why do you think that difference exists I don't understand why in football they can't see the benefit yeah. of having That's someone I mean. in position developing the side developing their own skills understanding of the team mm-hmm. giving it six months nine months a year at least yeah. before then making a decision really odd really odd because to bring in a new leader yeah. is a major change yeah. regardless of the organisation major yeah. change yeah. and in football they don't seem to give a fuck about a bed and in period they want to see immediate results now I understand the money influence but the the what's the word there's a side of me that would think okay in the corporate world we see well any organisation worth its salt sees that 
when there's a major change to yeah. place, there is a period. There is a, there's a period after where things are tumultuous yeah. for a while, and if you're lucky, it's tumultuous in a positive way. Yeah. If you're unlucky, it's in a bad way. But you need time to let it settle out and get some and need, see need, what the benefits. You need are. the ripples to kind exactly, of settle out. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. I would like to think football will see the same thing because they're it's a business. Yeah. Obviously, they're there to make money, but they don't. And I think that so I think that's that's the root of it. And I think that um, in previous years, you know, previous kind of football generations, and we talked about Alex Ferguson earlier. You know, he his first at least season, if not two seasons, were pretty average. It was only because he was there for a long time that he might, that he could then have his influence and, and go on to do all the great things that, he, that him and the team did. So th- there's that. W- what I think the kind of financial implications are is that if you win and you win trophies and you win the league and, you, and, and you're, you're top of the table, you get you know sponsorship, TV money, merchandise sales. You go on a, a Champions League run, which is you know more sponsorship. You know you you, you can then. Uh, you can then ask your sponsors for more because you're delivering more to them because of exposure and all these kind of things. So, but to do that, they need to win. And so, if they're not winning, I think that the the board and the club say, "Well, <coughs> we need to make a change because we're not winning," uh, which is why they then cut and replace. The flip side of that, though, is that, uh, and you know, I'll come at this from an academic standpoint. The research is really clear that the longer uh, someone has in a leadership role, the more effective they can be. And that is in business, in a whole, whole number of areas, but sport in particular. So I can't remember the stat on the average tenure of a Premier League manager, but it's something like six months. It's nothing. It, I, I, it might even be slightly. Less. It's it's a ridiculously small uh, time period. Now, professional rugby is under the same pressures, albeit the figures are less. Right? It's yep. not the gazillions of millions that football yeah. is, but rugby, nevertheless, the pressure is the same experience for mm-hmm. those organisations. It's just on a lower scale. Yeah. So why aren't rugby teams doing the same thing, behaving in the same way? They are and they aren't. So you have people like the Saracens head coach, and I'm forgetting, I'm having a senior moment, I'm forgetting his name. Um, he's been there for years, done really well. The the um, the coaching team at Exeter under Rob Baxter, been there for years, doing really well. Uh, you know, if you look across the Premiership, a lot of the coaches have been there for a number of years. Okay, um, but recently, Falcons, Newcastle Falcons, start of the season weren't doing very well uh, I'm not sure if they're bottom of the league or they were near um, their head coach got moved aside and a guy called Steve Diamond came in who was at, I think he was at Worcester previously and a couple of other places as well um, he might have been at Sale as well at one point um, so it does happen in rugby but not as much and I think that the and I think the reason is I think you've highlighted is it that there's the money pressure is there but it's not as intense. You think that's just what it is? Yeah. So I think rugby gets... And if you look at the... Uh, and you can look at clubs' financial annual statements and see what, they, what, what they're what they running as a profit or a loss. And in the rugby premiership, there's not many teams who are running a profit, so which means they're being bankrolled by someone or a group or something. So if you're ba- if you're ba- if it's being bankrolled and you're not having a, trying to sort of chase the dollar... There's probably slightly less, uh, mm. but then uh, saying that, if if your team hasn't done very well at the end of the season, you see coaching changes happen. But it seems to be on a season by season basis rather than we've lost six, ga- six games on the bounce. Uh, right, we're going to get rid of the head coach and get someone else in, mm. which you would see in football. Have you got any idea what the average tenure is for an NFL coach? Ooh, I wonder. Or baseball. That's in. That's an interesting I one. Wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Although the only thing is with comparing it stateside is obviously different legal, legal. Um, it's also franchises in a closed league as well, so there's no pressure for relegation or you know promotion or tenure you know. of an NFL. What am I looking for? Head coach. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look. The average NFL coaching career 
lasts 4.3 years. The me- No, that's the career. That's the career. Hang on a minute. Uh, how long is the average NFL contract? Only six NFL head coaches have been with their current team for six seasons or more. With most head coach contracts being five years. That means the vast majority don't get to sign on the dotted line twice. In fact, 75% of the league has at least one new coach since 2019, and some have had more than that. Uh, but that's still not as high a turnover as no. the Premier League. The average tenure for an NFL coach is approximately just 3.2 years. Does that mean with the same team? Yeah, probably. Must yeah, have. tenure, yeah. 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 But they, I mean, they do swap over. I was, I was, um, I was going to deliver some leadership stuff to uh, the performance team in the um, New York Jets, and because they didn't do very well, the guy got fired. So, <laughs> 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 so that didn't happen. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it does happen in the NFL. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be interested. I, I, I really, what you're talking about earlier with the you know, empathy on the impact of performance got really got me thinking. I feel like uh, I just like to see that implemented in places yeah. that I'm part of. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, I mean, but it also seems such an obvious thing, right? Be closer, connected to your teammates. Yeah. Do better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you distill it down, that's essentially what it is. Uh, the, you know, the, we don't need to fluff it or make it academic. It is, you know, be a good person, speak to your mates. And then the good things come. Um, I just wonder that if in, because it's professional sport, I wonder if the the idea of it being professional means that there's slightly less interaction sometimes because people turn up to work for a couple of hours, they do their training, they do their work, and then they go. Whereas if you think about, uh, if you think about the military, we, turn up to work but often we live where we work Mm. and you work with the people you live with so there is much more uh, there's much more of an ability to develop that kind of shared experience because just going to the cookhouse is a kind of micro shared experience with the guy who's in the you know or the bunk above you or the room next door whereas in professional sport they go home they leave I wonder if you could roll out <laughs> think it out loud now, dangerous. I wonder if you had a professional team in whatever sport yeah. and they rolled out as part of the contract to the players that one night a month or one weekend yeah. every quarter they are bunking down. Everyone's <laughs> bunking down as a squad. <laughs> like you know, like the reservists still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you're yeah. right you've got to do what 22 days a year you've got to do a 10 day exercise yeah. right as part of your contract new Bath player new Ospreys player uh, every quarter is going to be a weekend yeah. and we're going to go away as a squad and it's going to be West Down Cam it's going to be a green mattress <laughs> <Is> that- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll give you you will give you some warm kit yeah, yeah. yeah we'll you give you menu A in a location of your choice you could because you do the team building stuff right yeah. and, and, and they do the team building stuff they do all that I was going to say fluffy stuff then. I don't mean fluffy the bad way. Isn't <laughs> yeah, it? I know what you mean. Yeah, they do all that, that team building yeah. and cohesion and empathy building, all that, yeah. all that stuff, right? To improve performance because there's a reason for it, improve performance. But I wonder if you take it a step further. Go on, get out in the woods for a weekend. And Not the, the woods, but even just in no, you're you're on, absolutely yeah. right. And traditionally, all this stuff gets done in preseason, whereas actually you need to do it throughout the year. Mm. Um, and uh, an example is um, I was chatting to a coach he's back in New Zealand now but he was coaching uh, he was head coach of Leon in the top 14 and they were doing really well a couple of seasons ago when he was a head coach and um, one of the things that team did was every Monday morning regardless of the result they would come in and they would do something might not necessarily be rugby related they would do something as a group it almost didn't matter. It could, it could be board games. It could be, uh, you know, who can balance on one leg for the longest, whatever. The point is, they were doing it together throughout the season. The upshot was they were putting 50 and 60 points on other teams and their connection and their cohesion was incredibly high because they focused on it. 
So instead of coming in and doing an analysis session on the Monday morning of the game that's just gone, that uh, yeah, that game has been and gone. Um, we'll analyse it what we need to, but as a team, we are going to reconnect, work out how we want to go forward, and then take that into into the next game. And they would do that every Monday, or if it was a Sunday game, the first day they were back in every week, mm. and it and the performance showed. Because mm. one of the things there, we we, we connect in with other people and feeling and that empathy piece and shared experience, shared understand, mutual understanding is that um, you you feel you will feel you're more likely to feel bad if you feel like you've let them down by you underperforming right yeah it's, that, it's yeah. like increases the accountability doesn't it I think you're right yeah and especially if you if you can do it on a peer to peer basis rather than the coach or the leader sort of making you accountable if you find that as a group people are holding themselves to account that is exponentially more effective than a leader telling you what to do it's your it's your mate your teammate your friend saying hey look i've noticed this i, I went to watch um i was really lucky i got a free ticket to go and watch uh sacramento kings versus toronto raptors and i um I sneakily might have sat in the um season ticket uh, hold the seats <laughs> so I was about five metres from the edge of the court and I was right next to the uh, the Sacramento Kings bench and they put about 40 points on the Toronto Raptors by the end of the game but what I noticed was that the Sacramento Kings players when, when they were when one guy came off and was rotated off his teammates would get around him and they'd be like oh I noticed this what did you see you know, and they would be exchanging information about what was going on immediately there and then and peer coaching each other and saying oh you know this, this player and they, you could see them demonstrating stuff to each other about the opposition and how to either go past it or do a shot or whatever it was the other team the Raptors guy gets subbed off and they just sit on the bench there was a real there was a marked difference in how they were in how they were interacting with each other and I thought that's part of the reason why mm. yeah you you you'd think you'd think that there would, there would be like a, a list of basics that basic actions events processes that these top these high level teams yeah would implement because they know that these things work across the board yeah but obviously they don't I think I... so what, one example I gave the guys who I was mentoring from the Kings was um, uh, I used the example of post patrol debriefs and everyone does it slightly differently um, but essentially it's the same thing you say what did you see what did you notice okay great I noticed this of that what can we take forward and I said that's a really basic outline and everyone in the military does it you, know, you go out on patrol, you come back, you go through, you go through a process, of, of, and and I said this to them, and um, and they were like, oh, all right, that's who that's did you say this to? There's, guy, there's a couple of guys from the Sacramento Kings, so. Uh, and so it was. It's about systemizing your leadership and culture development, whereas traditionally it's somewhat ad hoc. But if you can build it into the system, if you can build a system that it's just part of what you normally do, like that the Leon rugby team I was talking about. That was their system. That was built into their timetable that they'd come in and they'd do that little reconnection first thing, mm. regardless of if you can build those kind of processes in, which which actually the military do, but we don't do it consciously and we don't do it for that reason, like the post patrol, you know, debriefs. We do to gather intelligence or to work out what we're gonna do next or all those other kind of things you would do for a post patrol brief. But actually the, the knock on to that is it allows us to do those things as other things. Yeah, it's a lessons learned session, isn't it? Or yeah. uh, after action review, post exactly. control. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the one of the traps that a lot of organisations fall into, big or small, sports or not, is that they only pay that 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 uh, that action. You know, to do to review what went on. Yeah. They only pay that any any attention when something bad went wrong. Yeah. When we have it, you should do it after every single thing. Yeah, and it's equally as important to do with things when went really well as opposed to went really bad. You know, and draw out, draw draw out those lessons and bits of information to go forward with. And, and I'd a, share. a team that had had done that very well previously before the head coach left was the Crusaders. So they won 
was it five out of the last six Super Rugby titles, but four on the bounce? Was it five on the bounce? Whatever. The, no other team in Super Rugby has done done that with Scott Robertson as the he was the head coach. He's now moved on to the All Blacks, and they would iterate every season. And yeah, great, we've won a Super Rugby title, but it was then what can we do differently? What can we do better? What processes are we doing now that we could tweak that make us a little bit different? And it was this con. And the best teams in the world iterate on a constant basis, and they they create these kind of like internal feedback loops. There's a great podcast. He, I can't remember which one it was, but he he basically said um, they have a new player come in, and after about four or five weeks, they say to this new player, "What have you noticed? What would you change?" Because they're the fresh eyes. Everyone else has been there for a season, two seasons, mm. five seasons, whatever. It's the new person with new eyes, and and this new player might say, "Well, actually, there's this, this," and they go, "Oh, okay." You know, note it down. There's some points for us to potentially look at and work on. So, uh, you're absolutely right in that if it goes badly you need to review if it goes well you need to review as well because that's the that's the things that you can take forward to improve performance mm. are you still playing no uh, I'm playing Gaelic football and hurling uh, <laughs> yeah, because I and I <laughs> I got to Canada and thought you know what I could uh, I could do a bit of over 35s and as I looked on Facebook and, and looked for the local rugby team, um, Facebook has this, you might also like, and it gives you some options. And, and one was the local uh, GAA team. And I thought, I don't really want to wake up on a Sunday all battered and bruised. I thought, I've never done that, I'll give it a go. And that was literally it. The Facebook algorithm <laughs> put, put me together. So I am playing, but I'm not playing rugby anymore. Uh, yeah, and I, I haven't issue. done for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm about to retire again, I think. I think. Is that retire again or retire? <laughs> Retire again, yeah, retire yeah, again, yeah. I think. I just, I do so many different, I, I box, I play rugby, I go to the gym, what else do I do? And I, the most, the injuries I get yeah. are almost always from rugby. But when I get an injury from <laughs> rugby, it, yeah. it rule, it just, yeah. I'm just written off everything. Because yeah. it's not, it's, I, it must be my age, but I don't want to say it's my age. I just take long to recover. And plus, I think I've had so much time out from full contact. Yeah. So that... And the other, the other thing that people do who are... And I'm, I'm 43, and the, and the things that uh, I notice is that... And this is this is a, an issue in the military as well, but certainly probably when you're... If you have a bit of a, a gap off sport, is you don't sprint unless you're playing sport. So you have time off and suddenly go... And you, your brain goes, woohoo, I'm 20 again, go! Ah, hamstring, ah! Oh. That is one of the reasons I built sprints into my training. I try and do idea. it at least once a month. Great idea. Yeah, oh yeah. my God. Oh my God. What? I mean, <laughs> even people who run... Yeah. People who... Pe- I'm going to tell people now. People here who think, yeah, I'll be fine at sprinting because they go... They, they run a three or four times a week. Yeah. They just run. Yeah. Go out and try sprinting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do a proper sprint session. You won't be walking the next day. I learned first time you will not be walking. It's something else, a completely different sport yeah. altogether. But um, wait, what have we covered? What have we not covered that you want to cover? Oh, uh, man, I think we've pretty much... So we, we talked about rugby vacancy. We've talked a lot about rugby, which is fine. Love a bit of rugby. We talked about the Grey Wolf team and stuff like that. So, yeah, man, that's, that's pretty much me. Um, I've got about six weeks left in uniform mm. um, and then I'm and then I'm you know footloose and, and fancy free six weeks I thought it was six months no six weeks left in uniform holy yeah, shit yeah 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 and then I go on my, my final leave and then that's me yeah yeah oh I didn't yep. know it was that short yeah, yeah, yeah. have you got your eyes on anything to do uh, oh, typical kind of military fashion I've applied for jobs all over the place uh, education sector sport uh, civil service, defence. In what kind of role? Uh, so I was looking at a director of sport role in a, in, in a school. That kind of thing interests me. Um, civil service was um, uh, it's a job in San Francisco. Actually, I thought I quite like San Francisco. It was kind of like a. Uh, it was a. It was called a. Oh, American civil service. No, 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 Brits. But but you say so you're posted over to San Francisco. Doing what? Uh, it's working working out of the embassy hub, looking oh, at, um, right. but being basically a liaison between um, uh, UK and US technology companies. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, yeah, so yeah, yeah that'd yeah. be really interesting. Um, so I've applied for that. Um, I've applied. Yeah, I've been speaking to some defence companies because 
the longer I'm in, the more people I know who are now out, mm -hmm. who are working for defence companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you say to a, a friend who's working wherever, oh, actually, I've got a couple of weeks left. And they go, oh, right. And yeah, uh, I've got a couple of mates in like financial services here in London as well. Uh, Don't do that. The, uh, it's nothing is off the table. <laughs> I'm going to say nothing is off the table, <laughs> but my preferred route might be, you know. Yeah. Only do the finances yeah. and nothing else yeah. is on the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. I, 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 spend, I think uh, I just, I've known quite a few. It just seems to be the thing that officers, anyway, go for when they, from my experience, they end up defaulting to, I'm going to work and sit in, in finance, and it's just like not exciting. It's almost like, yeah. I don't know, what's the equivalent for rankers? Probably be like probably be like the circuit. I'm gonna get out on the circuit. Oh, well, it was ten years ago. Yeah, the circuit. Because oh, God, everyone thinks everyone thinks the money's great and it's gonna be really exciting, and they realise that the money's all right, and actually it's not that exciting. Yeah, the problem. <laughs> is, like, I think you just alluded yeah. to it, really. The problem is that when you when you go and leave, you invariably think the most popular things and the most the the, the best opportunities to go into are though uh, they're things that just happen to present themselves to you because that's where your network is. Yeah. Like officers going to finance, blo blokes going to, going to the circuit because, you know, that's where, that's where everyone is. When in reality, you probably, it's like when you look at the night sky, isn't it? So you look at the night sky, yeah. you see what, 1%? You can only monitor, <laughs> oh, I think we can only monitor 1% of, yeah. of the entire like sky, can't we? So yeah. all he see is that 1%. Holy shit, there's all this other stuff out there. He's got to look around. So I look around, spend time flying around. The absolute strength of someone in the military, and let's just take, there's three of us in this room. One of them over there, you can't see on camera, runs a company that provides stuff to film and TV. You work for Viasat. Uh, you know, I've, whilst I'm still serving for a little bit longer, you know, I've been looking, I've been working with professional sports teams. You know, the, the ability for people in the military to do different things is out there, but I think some people just need to have the blinkers taken off and the aperture wide widened and then they go, Oh, actually I could go and do this or I could go and do that or and the military's really good, I think, at, at making people adaptable. Incredibly adaptable. Um we just I think service leavers then need to harness that and be adaptable when they're outside the military as well. Mm. There definitely seems to be a sea change at the minute going on, I think. I don't know what it is from your perspective. But where companies are increasingly looking for the softer skills in potential employees when they're recruiting, as opposed to only looking at hard, the, the you, you have to have the qualifications, you have to have this expert. They're, they're less, they're, they're now uh, paying less attention, paying attention to it. But yeah. it's not as big a deal if you haven't got all those qualifications, experience boxes ticked. Yeah. If you've got some of the other stuff they're looking for, I'm definitely seeing that with where I work with, yeah. with Viasat, and there's like you know, there's I see opportunities that come up to go and work there, and I know those opportunities would it would be great if there was technical expertise in the things that these opportunities do, but that's not what's being called out in the job description, for example. The yeah. job description is looking at we need you to be able to, you know, um, it's all about soft skills based, yeah, yeah good, good people, person, blah blah blah, all the stuff you would normally see in the small print of adverts back in the day yeah now they're paying a much more higher prominence i think back to the same it's the same thing it's about being able to what you have been talking about you know the value of a person in, as part of an organization how how they perform and how much quality they can give to the organization is is largely based on not entirely largely based on how they interact with the other people in the organization yeah i think I, you're right yeah you know um, and uh, that you're right and having gone through this process myself in the last few weeks yeah, you know, at the bottom of a job description, I've quite often it quite often says if you don't think you fit this job description one hundred percent, please still apply because they realise that people look at it and go, oh, "I'm not suitable for that" because I don't hit every mm. bullet point. But actually, you don't need to hit every bullet point. You know, knowledge you can get, but those kind of ability to lead and manage a team, develop a team, you know, develop empathy within that team to increase performance. That is something that you know. If you can hire for that, the performance of that organisation is going to increase later on down the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, how can people track what you're doing? 
get hold of you yeah so um, social media is probably one of the best ways I am on LinkedIn uh, they can uh, if, if it's rugby they're into it's at rugby vacancies and that's across the usual channels uh, if it is Grey Wolf Teams I am on uh, I post all the stuff on LinkedIn but also on um, on X as well uh, that's just at Grey Wolf Teams and as a website which is the same but with .com at the end of it all right perfect been a pleasure mate glad Thank to you. catch all you back yeah. and then uh, so six weeks time you'll be back in the UK then will you I will start my leave in Canada and then eventually I'll come back yeah 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 yeah. I will be in touch about Forces Barbarian stuff sounds interesting for yeah. sure yeah because you're not a member yet uh, he's not a member no. yet Bags unbelievable does, does Bags play Bags has played <laughs> Bags has played <laughs> Bags needs to get the together and Bags is a yeah, yeah. Uh, Bags is a um, original. an original. He's one of the first. Oh, nice. He was on yeah, the yeah. first Forces Barbarians squad in our first ever oh, nice. Forces Barbarians yeah, match. Yeah. yeah. Did we win? Did we win that? I th- don't know. I can't remember. Let's say yes. I can't remember. I mean, is, is is the opposition specifically selected to make it fun, but not too <laughs> not too taxing? Yeah. You know. The, well, yeah. that's the idea. But okay. It never happens like that. <laughs> Yeah, yes. yeah. The the we, we yeah. One of the cha- one of the challenge. I say one of the cha- one of the challenges of the committee mm. is trying to line up appropriate opposition. Yeah, we've nailed it. now we yeah. we know what we we're a Sunday. We're basically a Sunday rugby side. Yep. You know, you, you don't we don't have training sessions. You turn up on the day for the match a couple of hours before, maybe an hour and a half. And then you get on the pitch. People meet each other. Throw the to- ball. Away. Token stretch. <laughs> token stretch. Right. Token stretch. This sounds like my kind of right here. Yeah. And then and then you st- and then you start the match. Yeah. So because of that, what you don't want to be doing is mismatching with some awesome team yeah, like yeah, yeah. the Pacific Islanders. Oh my God. <laughs> I I follow them on Instagram and I, and I, wa- I watch some of them. I'm thinking, oh my God. I mean, these guys are you know some of them are a little bit older. Doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> No, we have, we have, we we have some yeah. great fixtures. So we we've uh, we're new. We obviously Army Reserves Wales. We played last year, and we narrowly lost. Mm. We should have won the game. We narrowly lost to them. You'd think they'd be a pretty tasty side. Army they Reserves. were yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. Like, we we played really well. Um, Cheltenham Civil Service you played Newbury I RMC. used to play I used to live in Cheltenham I played against Cheltenham Civil oh, Service oh did you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 we play old Lemontonians a lot up in uh, Lemonton Spa yeah. funny enough that's where our spiritual home uh, okay. anyway yeah. enough about yeah. forces by Marion um, <laughs> it's a good like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll get you involved been a pleasure no, with you. Thank and, uh, you. good luck with it good luck mate good luck Thank with you. the last six weeks good luck getting out good luck see how it goes going yeah. to work in the city doing finance hopefully it's not <laughs> touch wood <laughs> We'll see what happens, mate. We'll see what happens. Cheers, buddy. Pleasure.